Let us start by checking out the web interface of the Linkdorf 1120 because a lot of magic is actually happening in here. It's a very competent piece of software in a consumer device, to be honest. I've never seen anything this good. It's really worth checking out. Uh, the first thing you would do is actually to go to the output setup. And this really shows the functionality and the flexibility of this device. There's a nice little image here that shows us the intention of the setup you selected. Up here in your output setup, you can select if you want to use the main output, which is the speaker output, and how you want to use the line outputs that are over here. This is really genius because it allows you to use a 1120 in a number of different ways. Let's dive into it. First of all, the company has their own loudspeaker systems, which are typically little uh, satellite subwoofer combinations. This is the company's MH2 speakers. And if, say, we wanted to combine those with uh, their subwoofers, one of those, or even two of those, which would be the ultimate setup. It tells us how to connect the cables. It tells us how the standard uh, crossover frequencies will be set up. And we get the chance to verify the, the speaker setup so we can hear that everything is hooked up correctly. That is just awesome. The distance to each speaker is important in terms of ensuring that the timing is correct. Especially when using a subwoofer, you would want the main speaker and the subwoofer to be in perfect sync, even though that the subwoofer might be positioned further away or closer to you. Measuring the distances correctly is really important. And there's also some other considerations if you're not using a system like this, where the components are known by the manufacturer, they can do all kinds of little funky tricks in order to ensure that it will play really nice. If you using other subwoofers, for instance, there might be even be an amplifier delay in there or some processing or something that you need to take into account. So let's look saying these are my main speakers uh, that I normally use. And then I have uh, one custom subwoofer, for instance, uh, of another brand, maybe. In that case, we would be allowed to set up how we want the main speaker to work. We can decide if we want the crossover or the filtered signal uh, going to the main speakers where we apply this high pass filter to roll off the lower frequencies because the subwoofer is going to, to do the work for us. And we can even decide what filter types to use. And those are sharper or less sharp filters. Uh, as you can see that the roll off will be uh, more intense if you use uh, these types. And with these types that are very typical for use with subwoofers, uh, those are probably the right ones to use in this case, you know, with a nice soft uh, roll off. You can even have a level adjustment uh, if needs be. Let's say your subwoofer is really sensitive uh, or you're getting too much output, then we could maybe lower the level by 12 uh, dBs. Uh, all this is also possible to get it just right. You can set the uh, uh, crossover frequency depending on your setup. Um, and uh, in, in the case of uh, Linkdorf, actually, they swear by this technique where we use several subwoofers, two subwoofers in a boundary configuration. So let's say we had two custom subs, then we would be allowed to actually run these subs as a left right subwoofer. And if you do that, you can be allowed to use even a higher uh, crossover frequency. And um, you know, the, the, the problem with low frequencies is that once we reach a certain threshold uh, up in the frequency range, the ear starts to be able to detect where the sound is coming from. That's why we use low uh, crossover frequencies, usually with so uh, one subwoofer because then your ear can't really localize uh, where the sound is coming from. In this case, where we use a left-right subwoofer uh, situation, you would definitely want to use a higher crossover frequency because this uh, allows us to, to put less load on the left and right speakers, thus playing much louder. So you'll get way more power from your 
little amplifier here uh, by letting uh, the subwoofers do all the hard work in the low frequency domain. This just shows a bit of the flexibility. There's even a limiter for your main speakers. If you play really loud, you know, that can protect your speakers. And we can set these distances again. And for the subwoofer right here, you also can do custom settings. Uh, you do that for the main mains up here where we have our cutoff and down here, we do the same. Use the same kind of filter that should ensure a perfect a crossover between the main speakers and the subwoofer. And just look how nice this is graphically. It's really easy to understand and, and work with. Next thing is, of course, the really, really important part right here. The distance to the sub. Let's say that it's three meters from the listening position. That would be 300 centimeters. You can also uh, have it in inches. Let's say this is a little further away. And this parameter right here is extremely important. Let's say that your uh, active subwoofers has some kind of DSP in it. It will most likely have a little uh, delay that you need to compensate for. I've just uh, been using a Arendal subwoofer. It had eight milliseconds of delay. So I'm just using this as a example. So now we actually made our configuration. Of course, we need <laughs> very important the distance to the main speakers. I'm just fixing two meters and two and a half meters, for instance, right here. Um, and that's it. Now you have done a configuration of two satellite speakers being driven by the amp itself and two subwoofers uh, being fed with this uh, line output. Uh, and we have custom settings and custom uh, uh, crossovers and we have custom levels and we can see everything we're doing. We are delaying each component uh, to match each other perfectly. And of course, you can always go in and change this stuff. But that's the main thing that you need to work with. Another situation could be, let's uh, use this little amplifier just as a preamp. It could be that you don't really like the sound of the built-in amps. So I would like it to use it just as a preamplifier, for instance. That's perfectly possible. You'll just set the main out main speakers to none. And we'll use the line out, not for subwoofers, but, you know, in the advanced mode here, we can simply set up the analog output. In this case, I would not use it as a crossover. I would like the full range signal. And I would have maybe to level compensate to level match with my power amplifier. I could uh, run it in mono if I want to. Um, th that's, of course, you know, if you use uh, the output for two subwoofers or something like that, that where you don't want it in a left-right configuration. I want to regulate the output. If I run full scale, it would be more like a tape output, which is, by the way, also a functionality. Tape output will bypass the room perfect and all that stuff, um, all that processing if you use uh, the line out as a tape out. But in this case, we use it full range with the power amplifier. Uh, we can have the limiter on or off again, and we can also set distances, you know, for our, for our amplifier if needed. In this case, it would not be needed. I'll just set these to zero because the speakers are, of course, set up perfectly with the same distance and everything. So uh, now I'm using it as a preamp just by applying these settings. It just shows you some of the amazing flexibility. And we just scratch the surface here. Uh, let's go back and look on, on what you can do with subwoofers, for instance. We, now we are playing that we are using the line output to drive two subwoofers and we use the built-in amplifier to drive uh, left and right speakers. Let's do that just for the fun of it. Um, this section is actually really interesting in terms of uh, being able to um, customize a EQ curve for your speakers. In this case, we could do a custom curve. And now we are actually in the voicing functionality of the 1120. 
pretty amazing stuff. There is eight separate bands and different kind of filters. So let's say that we wanted to correct some little problem in the 65 hertz range. We have a bump in the room or something like that. We could lower that by 6 dB and we could also adjust the curve here, uh, make it really tight if needed. You see here we are performing a dip at a certain frequency, target frequency by 6 dBs. This filter I will call the Dipperu. Okay, 65 hertz. And this is now a custom EQ filter that I'm applying to my subwoofers only down here. And you can do some really advanced stuff. You even see how it's applied right here. So this allows you really to play with this. You can even uh, download the EQ and send it to a friend or you can uh, load up uh, EQs that some guy made for you and you have all these amazing possibilities. So the setup routine kind of ends here. Once you've done your main setup, then you can go to the room perfect setup. And this is where we measure our room and uh, create the filters that room perfect uses to compensate for your room. And uh, Linkdorf does this different in uh, comparison with other companies because they will measure out uh, your listening position first, then they will measure out the room by taking random measurements of the room, combining that into a, a room profile that they can then subtract from your main listening position. So by knowing how the room sounds, you instead of trying to correct the frequency response directly in the listening position, you actually make a, they make a kind of power response measurement of the room instead. And that is a very different approach to room correction that is pretty unique to Linkdorf. You can then add several new room measurements or add focus positions. So you can simply on your remote, you would be able to change your listening position and get a perfect sound in the spot that you're actually sitting in. Those positions will be available to you in the app and on the front page of the web interface here. We have run a room perfect right now. It's really easy to do and you're guided through the entire process. So let's dig into the setup of the amp. Now we did everything. Uh, we set up our, our system, you know, with subwoofers and all the stuff we, we wanted to do here. So, and we can play on the system even without running a room perfect setup. Um, but I would definitely recommend you do that. Uh, the effects can be pretty profound. And now we need to configure our inputs and that's really, really flexible too. The amp has four digital inputs right here and it has two uh, analog inputs and it also has a HDMI input. You see some of them are disabled right now. Um, the, if you look at each uh, input configuration here, you have an input name. Uh, let's just try to change this, call it X45, that is a file play of mine. Um, and you can even apply a custom voicing to it. Let's say that you just generally wanted uh, some uh, special filter on that source of yours. Uh, you can actually do that and you can apply your own custom filters if you want to. That will be a part of your input selection. Uh, you can use it in a theater mode if you're using uh, it as a part of uh, as a surround system. You can also adjust the sensitivity of each input. So when you select something, you would experience a match level. This kind of functionality is uh, better than what is seen in many custom installed products. So it is really flexible and will ensure you get exactly the results you want. So in daily use, you'll end up with some configured inputs and you have all the stream fun streaming functionalities. We'll get to that in a minute. You also get the possibility to set up radio stations as uh, inputs. So, and each of these radio stations could be uh, level adjusted, you know, in order to match each other. So when you go from the talk radio to the heavy metal radio, 
it won't uh, be uh, perceived louder than the other. You could even add a custom filter. The easiest way of uh, making a new voicing is actually just uh, by naming it. Let's co call it low cut filter. Because what I want to do is I want to filter out the deepest frequencies in order to avoid these big pops on the talk radio. And I do that just simply by adding using a high pass filter. It will let the high frequencies pass as the name suggests. So, uh, and that's typically everything below 80 Hertz is really painful. And in this case, we are using kind of a soft slope here. It will start around 120 to roll off the frequency here. I will save the voicing. And now when we go back to our input setup right here for my talk radio station that I usually don't listen to anyway, um, I can simply select my new low cut filter right there that I named and save the input. So every time I'm selecting this radio station, it is being gained three decibels to match the other uh, radio stations and the the low cut filter is applied. This kind of uh, input functionality you just don't see in other products as well. Uh, let's have a look at the audio setup. There's a couple of little cool features here as well. ICC is actually an intersample protection system. In modern mastering, those crazy mastering engineers uh, try to get the songs as loud as possible. And when they do that, they often pressure the level so hot that you can get distortion in between the digital samples. The ICC system tries to compensate a bit for that by actually lowering the level before it's re reaching all the processing inside the uh, uh, 1120. So this should always just be uh, on. It, I don't understand even why it's possible to, to uh, uh, turn it off, but that's how it is. You can also decide if you want to be able to bypass Room Perfect and us nerds, of course, we want to hear if, if, if it's actually uh, giving us something good. So that should be on. And you also have a subsonic filter. And, and what is that? We just made a low cut filter. A subsonic filter is a filter that is applied outside the um, the, your hearing range, uh, the deepest of deepest frequencies. The reason why you would need a subsonic filter sometimes is especially with turntables because they have uh, the ability to, to, to just generate really deep sub frequencies. So if you use a turntable, turn this on, it will do your speakers and your amplifiers good because it's a lot of energy being, being used for nothing if your system is trying to play back 5 hertz or 10 hertz frequencies. Over here, we have a section with volume control. Uh, right here, maximum volume means how far can your amp go. I actually have a friend with some electrostatic speakers that are really sensitive to to too high uh, uh, output levels. So he could set this up to ensure that some lunatic with a Spotify could never uh, turn it up higher than this. Here you set up your default volume. So when you turn on the amplifier, what is the starting volume? If you use it with the television and feed uh, a HDMI cable to the amplifier, you can through arc, you can get the sound from the TV, but you could also get control from the TV. And that is what CC is about. If you turn this option on, for CC power, then when you turn on your television, you will turn on the amp. And the audio system will allow you to, uh, to adjust the volume as well. Uh, so that's the functionality of the HDMI setup. Here in the streaming setup menu, uh, you can name your 1120, give it a name. If you have several units, they can have unique names, uh, kitchen. Uh, you can use it as a multi-room system. You can also decide whether your streaming players, your Spotify, your phone can actually control the volume or not. You can also decide if a streaming player like Spotify or whatever on your phone or iPad can change the input uh, on your 1120 
which is a really neat feature. Um, it could be that you don't want a lot of guests to be able to disturb your music playback, then you could simply just change this. Also, you can decide whether a streaming player can turn on your amplifier and start playing. In this case, this, of course, you want everything on. It's something you turn off if you have problems or the kids are, you know, doing stupid stuff. In the general uh, setup, you can decide about uh, things like the brightness level of the display, uh, set timeouts and decide when the amp will turn itself off if you're not playing. Um, you can also decide how the trigger input is working and you can decide if you have a remote control, which is an optional thing for this uh, amplifier, if that's enabled or not. In the network setup right here, you can configure Ethernet uh, by cable or your Wi-Fi. You could also uh, use static IPs and use it uh, with an Ethernet connection, which is what I'm doing right here. In the Manage software, you can uh, update uh, your software right here, which is done over the air. We can simply uh, select you know, the software from the remote server and update it. I have the latest software here. As you can see, you can also see what's uh, your current software version. If there's problems you need support, you can actually download system logs uh, of the amplifier. And we can also back up our setups if we add a USB device in the back. We can also restore setups from a USB device. So when you've done a great setup or a great room perfect measurement for a certain pair of speakers in your room, you can save it and recall it at any time. I would recommend that you uh, back up your settings every time you've done some genius stuff. So this is the setup pages uh, of the 1120, a extreme amount of flexibility uh, that will allow you to use this uh, little amplifier in a multitude of ways. It also goes for its uh, big brothers, by the way, the uh, 3400 and the Actually, it looks the same on the other linked off products. The MP, the big uh, multi-channel processors, they have the same kind of interface, uh, by the way. When I press the home button, I actually look at the uh, standard functionality that we have. Uh, really easy uh, to, to work with in daily life. We select our inputs. And if I have configured radio stations, for instance, I'll simply just go, yeah, let's hear that talk station, and that's it. You see the low cut filter is applied. We have the focus position um, set to on. We can see the input audio format. And this is of course not the input audio format from the radio station. It is what's coming out of the decoder, uh, the MP3 or AAC decoder into the processing of the amp. Uh, and we have the things that you would use in daily life. And all the streaming functionality is available from a little tab down here. It's also uh, available from the app. Here you can, can save your favorite uh, radio stations. There's 10 slots for that. And they use the VTuner uh, service to find radio stations. So we could uh, go search by genre, for instance. Uh, let's see if we can find some hard rock right there. Now we're looking at hard rock uh, stations. Of course, I only want to look at high quality ones. Dark radio right here. Yeah, that looks really awesome. Let's make a preset of that. Now we just added that to our favorites. Making that as a simple uh, selection from the front of the amplifier is simply done by adding it to the input setup. And that is done automatically with the 1120. So, oh, it could be that it was really loud. I want to adjust it or adjust the other channels uh, volume uh, in comparison with the dark radio. Or maybe I want this filter added every time I listen to that specific radio. It's really simple. Save. And now it will be available as a selection right here. Um, you see the filter right here is now music. When I use the dark radio and when I listen to P1, the talk radio, oh, I get my low cut filter. If you know of any consumer product of this type that has this kind of functionality, 
let me know in the comments. So that was a really quick walkthrough of the 1120 and all its wonderful features that you can tap into uh, when using the 1120 in multiple scenarios.